Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome my friend Ryan Shea to St. John's College. Mr. Shea is an alum of West Coast Great Books uh, School, Thomas Aquinas College, and the Catholic University of America. He spent several years teaching at Providence College, where he taught many classes in areas such as philosophy of science, envir environmental philosophy, and nature writing. He has been at the Nature Institute since 2022. His research weaves together ancient philosophical biology, especially Aristotle, the scientific revolution, phenomenology, German idealism, and Goethean qualitative science. His main project is to learn what it might look like to read the Book of Nature in a participatory, contemplative, phenomenological, and poetic fashion. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Shea to St. John's. Hello, thank you for coming. Uh, just a quick word, as Mary mentioned, um, I work at a place called the Nature Institute, which is a very small, uh, there's sort of five of us now, three to five of us. Um, and what we strive to do, what we articulate it as, is alternatively holistic science, or qualitative science, or Gertian science, or Gertian phenomenology of nature. So there is, for those interested, there is an actual tradition of this. It's very small, but it takes up the sort of work that you did at the very beginning of Freshman Lab with Goethe's Metamorphosis of Plants and strives to take that up as a research tradition. So I will be speaking uh, out of that tradition, if not as a representative of that tradition. For taste. In the description of this lecture, I gave two questions. What is phenomenology and how might we practice a phenomenology of nature? Those two questions will roughly divide the lecture into two different parts, but both of them will be pursued in the same spirit, which is to say, I will be attempting to perform phenomenology with and in front of you, rather than giving an answer to the question, what is phenomenology through reflection and definition? So first, we will try to get at what phenomenology is through performance, and then continue that into a phenomenology of nature. So let's begin. First and above all, we should say this about the relationship between thinking and perceiving. First and above all, an explanation must do justice to the thing that is to be explained, must not devalue it, interpret it away, or garble it in order to make it easier to understand. The question is not at what view of the phenomenon must we arrive in order to explain it in accordance with one or another philosophy, but precisely the, the reverse. What philosophy is requisite if we are to live up to the subject, be on a level with it? The question is not how the phenomenon must be turned, twisted, narrowed, crippled, so as to be explicable at all costs upon principles that we have once and for all resolved not to go beyond. The question is, to what point must we enlarge our thought so that it shall be in proportion to the phenomenon? We are now a minute into the lecture. The lecture has begun. You heard and attended to words that I was saying at the beginning, and now we are calling our attention to the fact that you heard words at the beginning, calling our attention to those words as themselves a phenomenon, beginning again at the beginning. 
hearing them as a phenomenon, first, an audible phenomenon, in reflecting, or let's say becoming awake to them, not merely as words, but as heard, you come to realize that in order for them to be the beginning of a lecture, they would have to be spoken. In order to be the beginning of a lecture, they would also have to be heard. Otherwise, I would be up here speaking to myself. And third, there has to be some, a space in between that would allow for speaking and hearing to happen together. Yes? So in reflecting back and becoming aware of the beginning of our lecture as an audible phenomenon, we have already begun to enter into a phenomenological mode with our first beginning opening. Attending it also to it as another form of phenomenon, as a logos, as a thing said about the world, it has given us a criterion for what would count as a good explanation or a good theory. So what is said is not that you should have all of the data, all the phenomenon that you encounter, and then smash them so that they fit your model, your theory, your hypothesis, but rather you should keep them both on a level with each other and grow your explanation, grow your thinking in order to bring it up onto the level to be in proportion to the phenomenon. And thus we've seen now not by my making a claim, but by your coming along with me, beginning with a phenomenon of something heard and something spoken, that we are not seeking an explanation for the beginning of this lecture, we are performing a phenomenology on it. Lastly, you can think the question, whose words began this lecture? It was, in fact, a quotation from Schelling. When you think of a quotation, what is a quotation? You could think of it as my letting you know what somebody else has said, right? So Schelling wrote something, and then I'm merely repeating what he said to let you know. But I invite you to think about another possibility of quotation. What do you call a quotation? What sort of phenomenon is that showing up where the words that are being said are the exact expression of how you would use words to articulate the same thing. When Schelling has done better for me, my expression, than I have for myself, when I use his words, his words have become mine by my words becoming his. And so to see it as a quotation is not necessarily to see it not as my beginning, but as Schelling's and mine together as well. And now we've seen the opening salvo show up in three different ways, not by my arguing for it, but through language, through logos, helping to draw our attention to the different ways in which spoken word can show up to us. This then, I would say, is a performance of what I'll call the phenomenological method or hodos, a way, rather than a method as a jig, an imposition or a projection. It's a very simple method. Start with the phenomenon, stay with the phenomenon, return to the phenomenon, which if I said it first as an initial definition would sound uh, grotesquely oversimplistic, right? But taking it in now, you saw what we did is we began with you simply experiencing something, the beginning of a lecture. But you didn't experience it as words heard. You heard through the words to the meaning that they were attempting to convey. And yet our attention can be called up to that. And so staying with the phenomenon as a second stage, as another approach of development, is not in the phenomenology that I'm attempting to perform a reflection, a turning away or bending away back from the phenomenon, but is 
more easily seen if you think of it as a wakefulness, a coming to awareness of your awareness, a coming to aware, wakeful attention of not only what you're attending to, but the way in which it shows up, which itself would sound like a needlessly abstract description unless you see it now again as yet again revealing something new in the structure of the opening of this lecture, a way of illuminating it, seeing it not only as an audible phenomenon, not only as a logos where it's saying something, not only as a quote, but also as an example or an illustration. And lastly, to end with phenomenon, not merely by going back to the way they first appeared to you, but by bringing what came to awareness or wakefulness back in order to see something more, something new, something deeper. Thus, here is supplied, I think, a first-rate test of the value of any philosophy which is offered us. Does it end in conclusions which, when they are referred back to ordinary life experiences and their predicaments, render them more significant, more luminous to us, and make our dealings with them more fruitful? Or does it terminate in rendering the things of ordinary experience more opaque than they were before, and in depriving them of having in reality even the significance they had previously seemed to have? Did anybody, while I was reading that, see me as reading a quotation? You saw me lean down and read off of a page once before, and it was a quotation which might have indicated to you that, yes, this is another quotation from John Dewey's experience in nature. And here in there, not merely a claim by Dewey, but here it also in aware juxtaposition to our opening salvo from Schelling. What Schelling was asking of us was to get a better explanation that doesn't crush the phenomenon to grow into it, to match the phenomenon. The litmus test, the criteria was for what makes a good explanation or theory. What Dewey is asking of us is not how to get a better theory, not how to get a better explanation, but to ask of any philosophy or thought put forward the following litmus test question. Does it make the world bigger than before? Does it allow you to experience directly more than it was before? Does it leave everything there but add? Or does it take away the experiences that you initially had? That is Dewey's litmus test. And I would say a good criterion for distinguishing between whether or not an explanation or an inquiry is phenomenological and whether or not it is attempting to gain knowledge in a way where you go away from what you're presented with in order to get a theory about it. But this, again, all can very easily be itself not illuminating and quite abstract. So now, here's where we're going to start doing something different, where we're going to start co-participating in phenomenology together. Right? So beginning to become aware of this lecture as something more of a workshop done in a group, or perhaps more in keeping with a concert than with a lecture, with a performance to be experienced rather than a series of claims to be either agreed with or disagreed with. And so my repeating mantra, bass tone question will be, what do you see? What do you see? Hexagon, yeah? All right, we're gonna do a small math experiment together or demonstration. What do you see now? Yeah. Hexagon divided, all the lines are meeting in the center, right? You're all seeing that. Very straightforward. All right. This is the phenomenon that we're encountering. Now, I'm going to speak a word, a logos, and we'll see what happens. The word? Cube. Oh, 
some ahs, some whats, some ohs, some laughter. So, we attended to this, we experienced this, and now, in the phenomenological manner, we're going to stop and pause and become awake and aware. Try one more. There's two cubes hiding in there, different orientations. One opens from this side, the other flips and opens from this side. Can everybody see both cubes? Some people can, some people can't. Some people are trying to indicate how to look at it in order to get the cube to pop out. And now you're laughing because I'm becoming so meta, you wonder if there's going to be a top level to this at any point. There won't be. So notice, notice, thank you. I love enthusiasm. So become aware, don't reflect, attend to your attention, become actually experientially aware of the way that this experience is, is happening. When you looked at this, you saw hexagon. Now, retranslate it back into flat lines. Can you do it? Can you see the hexagon, right? So you hear hexagon divided, and looking with that, you can see it. Looking with cube, you can see a cube, if I say, find the two cubes, you can see both of them. So, first, we noticed that when we encounter it, even the first one, when I showed you this, you didn't just say lines, and you, just, you didn't just say, I don't know, like black on white background. You all saw a hexagon. You immediately apprehended it as a gestalt. So here, you apprehended this as a gestalt immediately, without thinking and question, without reflection, as your immediate phenomenal encounter. And yet, when offered a new logos, a new form of wakefulness, it was able to point, jump out differently. And so now it can be more than it was before. Not by your assenting to that's a claim that I'm making about this, but you're having experienced that and come to experience that you're experiencing it. This is the, the more traditional cube, right? Which is very, let's try a hard one. Can you make this one be two-dimensional? Harder, right? Two-dimensional figure, people do that? Yes, some? Two to, yeah, so I have difficulty with it. This one's very cubey when you first get at it, and getting it to be two-dimensional figure with lines is much harder, right? Try picturing it as a complex pattern that you would find in quilting, right? Or that you might find on the floor in a museum. Can you see it now? Yes, some nods. Again, another phenomenon, some people can see it, some people can't. What experience is happening in this room right now? Is it flat experience or something else? Those help show up the two, the different dimensionality, the three-dimensional one, trying to see the middle one juxtaposing, right, in two dimensions. Or look at it like this. Think two-dimensionality with this, and now use this as a way of sort of fulcruming up to the two-dimensionality of this. Yes? What do you see? This is the, the workshoppy part. This one, sides of cubes. Someone has seen it before. Everybody else saw circles with lines going through. Where did it come from? Look at your looking. What are you seeing when you look at that? instantaneously, you could see. Now, look at these. Do they show up differently? Do you now see them as parts of a gestalt? Whereas before, you just saw circles with lines with different white parts cut through. But now, in the way that if you were vacuuming and you saw a puzzle piece, you know it belongs to a puzzle, even if you can't see where it goes. Is that tracking anybody's experience? 
Throughout, if it's not, think to yourself, the litmus test for the success or failure of this talk is not the truth or falsity of what I say, but whether or not you've experienced something. If you haven't experienced it, then you haven't experienced it. It hasn't made the world more and bigger in your direct encounter. Get them nice, juxtaposed side by side. What do you see? Nobody wants to say because they can feel they can feel it's a it's a trick. Can you see a rabbit? So the, the famous duck rabbit. You take the word, the logos, duck. You take the logos rabbit, even directionality. I can just do it with pointing, causing it to show up. Can you see both of them simultaneously? Oh, yeah, it, came, it popped up. Which one wasn't there? The rabbit. So you could only see duck. For a time, there were people in the room who only saw a duck. Bringing that to your awareness, that you always apprehend it as a gestalt, or apprehend it as a gestalt because you want to see a gestalt and you haven't yet seen which gestalt it is. Secondly, what this helps us see is that the same things can be apprehended as, seen as, as Wittgenstein would say, being very similar to Goethe. In seeing the lines as a duck, something happens. In seeing them as a rabbit, something else happens. Here's a challenge. Can you see these lines as two-dimensional, as just black lines on a white background? Can anybody both de-duck and de-rabbit it? Anybody? Anybody? It's, uh, yeah. It's incredibly, so notice this as a phenomenon. Some gestalts, once they're seen, won't be re-accessible to experience in another way, even though you would say you know intellectually, right? You know that it's lines and that you're apprehending it as, but I'm calling attention to your experience, not to the descriptions and accounts that you give of your experience afterwards, but coming into wakefulness of that experience. Returning to words. This can be a read-along. I'm going to read it slowly. Let's all do it together, or whoever wants to. Do you find this simple to read? Because of the phenomenal power of the human mind, most people do. According to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter what order the letters are in. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be in the right place. The rest can be a total mess, and you can still read it without a problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Talk about cool. Right? Now we've had an uh, audible phenomenon, visual phenomenon, and reading. What's happening in reading such that you can apprehend this? Not as an explanation. The phenomenologist doesn't ask for an explanation. They ask for some idea that will help illuminate what is being discussed, not an explanation off to the side, a theory, a hypothesis that will attempt to map or represent or otherwise make small enough the experience so that it fits in the bo box of our explanations and our understanding. Okay. On this next one, I will ask you what you, very important instructions. On this next one, I will ask you what you see, but you are forbidden from talking. Don't say it. I'll let you know when you can say. Don't say any words, but I will ask the question, what do you see? Don't say any words. Anybody who sees something, raise your hand. 
Anybody who doesn't see something, raise your hand. Those who see to those who don't see, one, become attentively aware. So what is being experienced here? Is it the same? What do you see? Say one word. Wait. Somebody who sees, say one word or logos, really nice and loud. Giraffe. Those who didn't see, is there a giraffe there now? Huh? Does everybody see a giraffe? Some people don't see a giraffe? Let's use another fulcrum to giraffify this in your immediate experience. So just pointing out that democratically, the giraffe seers, the giraffing people who are giraffing with their organized ideas by apprehending this as a giraffe gestalt, outnumber the non-giraffe seers. But this is not how phenomenology works. It's not a majority, it's not most people, it's what is experienced by you right now. Does anybody still not see it? Couple. All right, let's use a fulcrum to giraffe it up. Maybe instead of schematizing things, we could move from phenomenology taken abstractly or broadly into the second part, a phenomenology of nature. Does this giraffify? The giraffe. To make into giraffing the experience of looking at this. Can everybody see it now? Yeah. So pointing out a couple things. One, my repeated, re there's some people who can. Mary Elizabeth. <laughs> this is its, no, it's the head. This is the eye, those are the horns, this is its mouth. Yeah? <laughs> Performing phenomenology. You thought that I was exaggerating. <laughs> Here's another quote. This one is from a Goethean phenomenologist of nature. My teacher's teacher. His name was Jochen Bachemuel. He speaks as follows. When the concept is experienced as a classification discovered in the world, its character is to exclude. And as it embraces an ever wider variety of phenomenon, it becomes ever emptier. With such concepts, we separate ourselves from the world. For what I see in the world is dependent upon the concepts which guide my seeing. What I see in the world is dependent upon the concepts which guide my seeing. Experienced as a specific form of illumination, not as a classification, on the other hand, the concept becomes richer and fuller the more that single phenomenon can be seen as related in its light. In this way, we grow together with the world that surrounds us. And so you hear again, in this building of quotations, how Dewey, the litmus test, moved beyond Schelling's idea of an explanation being big enough for a phenomenon, and how Bachemuel's quote moves us a step further to say, you can think about thinking in two ways. You can think about thinking as a series of ideas which are boxes in which to put the world, or you can think about ideas not as a way of sorting out reality, but as lights, as sources of illumination. And so that we don't ask, is it true or false? Does it correctly delineate the world or not? We ask, taking up this idea, what does it illuminate? What does it show forth? Taking up giraffe, what does it illuminate? And what does it show forth? And to those who say, 
Well, yeah, Bachemuel, but why should that be the way that ideas are understood instead of as categories and boxes? He might say, your invitation is to take up this idea about ideas and seeing what becomes illuminated. Is the world, as Dewey asks, bigger as experienced? Is there more there than was there before? Is it deeper, richer? Or did you start losing things? Was something left out? So we turn now from a more schematic performance into our encounter with the natural world, pointing out that we are in a lecture hall. These are all photographs and drawings and diagrams by necessity. A phenomenology of nature is a going out into the world in order to see how the world might show itself up to us differently. And so our guiding idea in the second half will be how might nature be a teacher? How might nature be a light to illuminate what we see? instead of what could easily be accounted for in Gestalt psychology to say, well, this is our logos, this is our idea that we are imposing onto what we see and structuring it and ordering it in that way. What we've seen so far is all of your experience is always of Gestalt apprehension and really much more than Gestalt, right? When you look up here at me, you don't see colors. You, what you would say is you see somebody giving a lecture. Think of the levels of gestalt complexity involved in your immediate apprehension as experience of somebody giving you a lecture, giving a talk, performing phenomenology. So now we go to it with this light. What might be shown up if we view nature as showing us up things from herself? So looking at these giraffes. Color got a little off. We'll have the same question for the second half of the talk. What do you see? Was, was that nearly as hard as that? Wildly easy. And yet, if you stop and become wakefully aware of the way in which you attend and are present to phenomenon, you realize the same must be happening every time you see a giraffe. They show up as splotches of color on backgrounds. You don't apprehend that and infer something else. You immediately apprehend giraffe. What else do you see here? Sorry? Greenery. What's the relationship between these two giraffes? Right? They show youth, and you realize you might be wrong. You could be mistaken, which is itself another very fascinating phenomenon to take account of. But they show up in this way. Even look at their gestures, right? For those of you have, who have children, right? Look at the young one. He's a, totally turning his head towards you with this sort of reckless, abandoned curiosity. Whereas the parental figure has, again, if anybody's watching kids, if you sense a danger, you don't look right at the danger. You, you go out into a peripheral vision and try to be simultaneously aware, not of what your eyes are focusing on, but where the danger is, where your children are, and what a means of escape would be. Yes? Again, the question is not, did I give a correct phenomenological account, but did something show up through that account? If not, I failed. If so, I succeeded to some small degree. What do you see? Everybody's got that? Yeah? No difficulties there? Again, we laugh. Why? Because it's easy to see a leaf, we say. But of course, what's been brought to our attention in the first part, not as a claim but as an experience, is that this is just as complicated as the cube, as the duck rabbit, at least as complicated as the giraffe. But we all immediately do it always already. What do you see? Two leaves. 
a new leaf. Notice those are different. To see a new leaf, you have to see it as a slide following this leaf. A new leaf, not merely two. Anything else? What do you see? Maple leaf and oak leaf. Which one's maple? Maple left, oak right, yeah? Not only can you apprehend them and identify them, I assume there are a lot of people who could not identify it as a, it's actually a red maple and a white oak, right? Could not identify them? You just saw leaves. But no, you didn't just see leaves. What did you see? If I asked you to describe them, if I asked you to draw them, could you see the relationship between them? What's the relationship? Right? Yeah. You can so attend to this. You saw this as a phenomenon that you would normally just overlook because obviously it's there. Why would you bother stopping and looking on this? And the phenomenology of nature must be infinitely hard because how would you get at the ultimate essence of things? Maybe, as Goethe says, nature is an open secret. And unlike Heraclitus says, it does not love to hide, at least maybe not in all ways and in the ways that we thought. What you're seeing when you're comparing them is their relationship. Their logos not as an organizing gestalt, but in the way that you'd be familiar with as Johnny's, logos as the Greek for ratio, which we hold as relationship in mathematics. How are two figures related to each other? What do you see here? Many leaves, are they all the same? Chaos, disorder, is that fair, disorder? Not or messy. Think about that. You see the, the interrelationship of all of them as not ordered, as messy. You're now beginning not merely to apprehend the logos as the gestalt and the logos as the ratio relating to things, but the analogos, how different relations are related to other relationships. Begin as an imaginative exercise to start sorting these. Who goes with where? Can you start doing that? In your imagination. A new phenomenal realm, just as accessible to you. You can all feel it. You're either doing it or you're not. And if you're doing it, you're starting an internal, experienced, uh, apprehensible, wake up toable phenomenon. But it's not visible in the normal way that we think. But neither is the ratio, the relationship between these and yet it's directly apprehended, directly experienced. Here is my little attempt at organizing them. Okay, feels a lot more orderly, right? Do you see the principle that I use for organizing them or do you just feel that it's better? Not, not even necessarily right, you might have like little uh, scruples about what goes where, but you feel well, thank God, right? It's better than that. <laughs> Calling your attention to the awareness that you had of the immediate experience of, oh, that is more ordered and that is better, as all, that all of you are immediately and quite easily doing right now. And yet how difficult it would be to bring not that reflective description, but that awareness of your awareness without turning away from the phenomenon themselves. It's easier to start than you think, but it might be more impossible to end than you suspect. A more challenging one. What do you see? Oak. Take out the hard ones. Add in an easier key. Another easier key. Using these as fulcrums back. We heard it already. A word spoken, oak. But how can we hear oak? We can hear oak of one of two ways, Bakamil says. We can hear it as a category, 
to box and say these are all oaks and those which are not like this are not oaks. We can do taxonomy in a Linnaean way where we put the phenomenon as they group with other ones or we can think oak as a light and ask ourselves for all these different species of oak, if we think of them, look at them, look at them with oak light, how might they all show up as oak differently? In other words, how do you apprehend that a family looks similar? Again, Wittgenstein, family resemblance, this key issue. We can recognize somebody that belongs to a family, but not because of single specifiable detail always, not because they all share the same nose, not any particular one thing, and yet we can feel them all, see them all, experiencing them all as, oh, you must be one of the Stevens. And so, too, we can come to apprehend oakness through this lens. New one. Maple. Got it right off the bat. But now, we would normally say, oh, I did it, good, done, I apprehended it as maple, I've sorted it correctly. But you feel now the difference between that and thinking in maple, can you actually feel how they're all maples? Can you imaginatively live into them as different maples rather than being comfortable that you've put them in the right box and that an expert won't come and show you that you have gone the wrong way? Here's a real picture of maples. Returning back now, bringing this awareness, this wakening up now to familiness. Not only do we see logos as gestalt, logos as ratio relation, and a logos as proportion between different things, we're now getting at something else, some familiness recognition, and so that you can apprehend the left as representative of maple family and begin to possibly experience the right as member of oak family, to which you might be saying right now, I don't see that, to which I would respond, then I have failed so far. But I'd ask you to remember the giraffe, which was seen by many and not by some. The question that I would invite for you to ask in a phenomeno phenomenological mode is not, am I right? that nature is becoming its own light to reveal to us. But if you use that as a mode of inquiry, what might become directly apprehendable and experienceable to you? What do you see? Maple. Oaks? Everybody's cool with oak? All right, we just saw family as an apprehendable, either apprehended by you or at least the gesture towards apprehension if you couldn't see maple and oak as families. Now I'll speak a logos to illuminate this, to help us out. Same tree, same individual tree. What do you see? Do you see that? Or are you entering into a hypothetical mode of maybe this is why they look like that? Yeah. You see differences and you attempt to get out of the phenomena to explain the differences. Schelling says make it as big. Dewey says turn towards it. Bacamille says cast a light, see what's illuminated. Same tree. Let's add a second logos, make things interesting. Same tree, different height. Anything show up? Which one's higher? Bigger ones are higher. Is that a guess? You think the smaller ones are higher? Smaller ones are higher. Some people say bigger ones are higher. Some people say smaller ones are higher. So these are all leaves that were collected by my boss and colleague, Craig Holdridge, when he was working on this single tree, taken from two very different levels. One more logos, sun exposure. More sun, less sun. Bigger ones are? Sun. 
Some say bigger means more sun. Some say bigger means less sun. So let's attend to this. What we're doing right now is trying to exit out a phenomenon to come up with an explanation of them. Were we to stay there, then we would have exited phenomenology. What we're trying to do is not have guesses that are then confirmed or disconfirmed by an expert or somebody who knows the person who actually collected them from the tree, but to see if we might work towards possibly seeing it. So here, teacher's manual. Do you guys want to know the answer in the back of the book? Or should I leave it as a mystery? The good news is getting this answer will do nothing to lessen the mystery. So we both get it. Same tree. It was in the forest. Red oak. All of the top leaves were taken from a single twig on the very top of the canopy with sun exposure. All of the bottom leaves were taken from one twig from a lower branch being ensconced by the rest of the canopy. Do you believe me or do you see that? Or do you begin to half maybe see it's a duck and it's a rabbit but you can't make it flat? Maybe it's a giraffe. Somewhere in the middle. Reminding us our criterion is not, am I right, do you believe me? But does it actually illuminate something? If it doesn't, set it aside and develop more. What do you see? Now everybody's becoming worried and skeptical. I gave you a logos here and a few to add up. Single tree, single individual. Here, here's a logos for you. See if it lights up anything. Same species, different individuals. Here's the answer. Notice that in being an answer, it might merely make something show up to you, but does not explain it. It actually has made it accessible and therefore more mysterious, bigger than it was before. The one on the left is an oak, white oak. These are drawings by Craig Holdridge again. He showed me a lot of this stuff. White oak in the middle of a field. No other trees around. This same species growing in the middle of a forest. What you're not seeing in this picture is all of the other trees that are below it that he didn't draw. You see that now? It can show up as a canopy. So notice we saw an individual leaf show up to us as a gestalt, a relationship between oak and maple show up as an experience, a family of oakness and mapleness, and now the and a single individual showing different environmental revelations, and now different individuals of the same species revealing to you the environment from which they came. The dialogue that they had with the environment becomes readable, accessible, or a possibility of readability. Entering now to our last and culminating example. What do you see? I heard maple leaf, I heard weird leaf. Here's a primer, as you might suspect from the way that talks normally go. These belong together. I'm not showing you random slides, right? But again, think about that, bring that to awareness you're always apprehending what's being given to you to apprehend within the context of assuming I'm not trying to mess with you and that I might have something possibly to disclose. This is some of those plants all hanging out together from which this leaf came. Here are some of the different species, the families that showed up to us in maple and oak. Same kind different species manifestations of their different leaves. Here, 
Here is the dream of the taxonomist, of boxes to fit in the different uh, species, to say this is the species typical leaf for this species, and this is the one for the other of this kind. And here is the anatomist's dream, how to see the whole by dividing it up into parts and seeing them all as immediately accessible. Here, my dream. What are these? What do you see? What do you see? Outlines? Begin. Lines? Does anybody see lines? Would you, if, if you had not gotten to this place in the lecture, knowing that you're probably going to be, how would you put it, messed with? Or is there something not messing with some dewey in way of maybe more can be seen if we see it in this way, and having that always be your question. You would never say you see lines in every day, right, if somebody showed this at the beginning of a lecture. What do you see? How many leaves? How many different kinds of plant? Four, one, other guesses? Two. Two, one, four, anyone want to do three? Round it all out, get all the logical possibilities down. I will speak a word, I will speak a logos, but still always saying, I want you to hear the logo I speak as illuminations, as a possible hint towards what it might be to apprehend nature itself as speaking a logos, and point out to you that these are not how you apprehend the leaves when you go out to them. This is, these were pulled off and then super schematized, right? The logos is same plant. One plant, same, not in kind, same individual plant. What do you see? Oh, tell me what you see. Use, use your words. Use your logo. Different stages. We could apprehend this first, just notice as a gestalt. You could just take this as a static picture with different shapes. That's interesting. And as a gestalt has interrelationships, right? But if I said sequence, then you see it differently. Something else shows up. Yes? Everybody experiences sequence. Where's the beginning of the sequence? Democracy has failed. <laughs> who would show you this? Do you know who would show you really, really quickly? The plant, if you went out and watched it grow over time. Right? Pretty quickly, it would let you know where it starts and where it stops. I don't have it in here, and we don't have all summer. But again, I reiterate this, that my... Uh, light idea to see if it works is that what we're doing here is a ersatz inside beginning version of what might be apprehensible if you went out into the natural world and let it be its own illuminating light. You want to know the answer? Jump to the back of the book, teacher's manual, that reduces none of the mystery. Do you believe me? Yes. Now some are actually worried he might be legit old school messing with us, showing that up as a possibility. What does it mean to believe in authority? What does it mean the difference between saying, I believe it's true because somebody else has told me I've never experienced and don't really understand, but they have credentials and experience. So this, what we will perform right now together, 
in these last minutes is, let's call them training wheels, beginning apprehensions for the possibility of lighting into the way that the world shows itself. It is a sequence of change and metamorphosis. Transform the leaf on the left to the leaf on the right. How do you transform it? In, in, where does the transformation happen? Right? Where? You can be, if, you, if you feel the one transform into the other, they're both still there. When the duck gestalt switches into the rabbit, they're both still apprehendable. But here something else happens. Something is actually being tracked out and traced. Not a clever drawing, but the plant itself is going through these. Let's put training wheels on those training wheels. Transform. See this first as just two triangles that have a, a ratio, a logos, a relationship. You do Euclid, you can see triangle on the left is to the one on the right, as some third figure is to some fourth figure. Right? You're all very good at that now. Now don't see them as two things having a relationship. See this not as a single gestalt, but what we can call it a time gestalt. What Goethe insisted on calling a building, saying that if we are doing a morphology, it cannot be of static shapes, it must be of those shapes in metamorphosis. And so morphology, a term that Goethe is often credited with coining, immediately is a metamorphology. It is a metamorphosis, a changing of shapes. Easier, can you transform in yourself, in your imagination, the one on the left into the one on the right? You can feel it, right? You can feel it grow up equally out into it. Now transform left to right. Hmm? Not seeing their relationships, but them transform into each other. Can everybody do that? Begin to do that? Notice this is itself a phenomenon, something you can do, something you can begin doing and feel yourself as pretty okay at it, but not great at it. Now let's work through this. We'll go through training wheels. Start with the one on the left, feel in your imagination going out and blackening. Expand the black out. And now transform it into the one on the right by contracting and variegating the black in. Can you do that? Hmm? Move down into it. Where is that change felt? Where is it experienced? We say in ourselves. Where is that in? Now, left to right as we always read. Same, expand the black out into your imagination, contract and variegate and differentiate it back in. Yes? Expand out into the one on the left and try to strive to contract it back into the one on the right. Expand into the one on the left, contract it back into the one on the right. Expand, bring back. Does this show up differently now? Do you experience it differently? Not do you believe me that it is a sequence, but can you feel more, not perfectly, more than you did when we started? All right, let's complete it. I left, a, I left a gap. Let's complete it now. Ah, you do see it because you see this as a joke, as a punchline. This is not right. I'm proper messing with you this time. Okay. Let's go again. Feel in yourself, live into in yourself, this metamorphosis. Don't take my word, experience it. Better, but no, no. 
You experience it as off in the same way that you experienced the messiness of the thing I had before of all the leaves together. You experience that as off. This one, more obvious. This one gets to a little bit more subtlety. Can you imagine now what the missing one looks like? Can you see it? Can you experience it in your imagination? Good? We do this all the time. It's called music, what you could call musical thinking. We have a capacity to apprehend a whole in a part, and a part in a whole not merely as a gestalt, but as a time gestalt, as a building. So that Goethe says for us, what is formed will be formed again. If we want to behold nature in a living way, we must follow her example and become as mobile and malleable as nature herself. We must move from a static apprehension into what could be called a musical imaginative apprehension of the plant as a growing being. And so we can get this, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, Happy birthday, dear, enter name here. Happy birthday to you. All of you could hear that melody when I showed you this. Note something very important. The C at the beginning does not turn into the D. You could only hear, because of the way throats work, one note at a time, right? The different notes don't change into each other each of them stays what they are. But what we hear is the melody. So in the plant, these leaves are fully grown. They do not change into each other in the sense of the lower basal ones growing into it. All of these are fully formed. So what are we apprehending? The melody of dynamism that plays through the leaves as individual notes. Hear that as a claim that I'm making that must be either justified or argued for, and hear it as a light that might illuminate that. And I'll end by pointing something out. In the metamorphosis of plants that all freshmen read at the very beginning of lab, you'll notice he doesn't really talk about the leaves themselves on their own. The metamorphosis that he's talking about is the change between the leaves and all the different parts of the annual flowering plant. Goethe wants to say the leaf becomes by a contraction into all of the sepals in the calyx. They expand into all the petals in the corolla. They contract into all the stamens and pistils, and they simultaneously expand and contract into the fruiting and seeding. You can very easily hear that as just a weird thing that Goethe said, and we saw already the way in which it's difficult to do it even with the metamorphosis of foliage leaves. So leaving this buttercup, can you see this coming out of the leaves? Much harder, right? Not believe it, can you see it? And so, oh, some people can. Awesome. For those of us that can't, oppose it as a possible light to light a path rather than a claim to be made. And let's return back where we began with the phenomenon of quotation. Here's Bacamule again, speaking about the relationship between human beings and the natural world, coming into this question of what is the human task, what is the human ergon, what is the human vocation. Here's his try at that. How is it related to the rest of the world? He says, in the human organism, the individual presents himself to the observer through the different forms of expression. Organs and internal functions remain hidden from view in the human. In the landscape, it is the other way around. As the organs and their functions are immediately perceptible, whereas the expression, language, and unity of the whole are only found by bringing things together in an 
in an inner vision, a directly apprehensible but inner vision. Another Goethean comments on this. The language of the landscape, the language with which we began, the quotation from Schelling that we reflected on to get us into the phenomenological mode, the language of the landscape is a gestural language. The landscape is obviously not itself speaking this language. Rather, the language is concretely or objectively expressed in the organs of the landscape, which are spread out or external to each other in the visible forms of rock, plant, and animal. Only through the thinking or inner vision of the researcher, through what we began to do together, only through that inner vision, that's still a vision, what Goethe called Anschauung, a, a, uni, a unification of, since we're at St. John's, the bottom and top of the divider line, not to put too fine a point on it. Only through the thinking or inner vision of the researcher, that is through some kind of phenomenological research, does the landscape actually come to speak. Thus, we can say that human speaking or other creative expression is the most heightened form of the phenomenon. And so we come at last to possibly one more aspect that can show up for the phenomenon of quotation. Perhaps if we silence ourselves enough through devoting ourselves to the phenomenon, we can, through an inner transformation that becomes as mobile and malleable as nature itself, come to correctly quote the natural world to become the place in which a silence of another voice may speak. Thank you. <laughs>